So good morning, everybody, and welcome to St. Altman's. It's lovely to see you. It's a bit chilly out there today. Um, so my name's Mina, and I'm the vicar, and later on you're going to hear from James, who is the associate minister. He's going to bring us our sermon. Now, we are starting this week a sermon series about mountains and valleys. So throughout the Bible, there are stories that involve mountains and valleys, and it, uh, the stories that happen there reflect a lot of the ups and downs of life and the challenges we face, and the fact that whether we're on a mountaintop and having a mountaintop experience with God, or whether we're down in the valley, God is always with us. So um, up until Palm Sunday, we are going to be exploring mountains and valleys. And our first valley, uh, no, not our first valley, our first mountain is today, and that is Mount Ararat, which is the mount of God's promise to Noah. And um, that's where we get the rainbow. And I know that the children are going to have the opportunity to paint some rainbows today if they would like to, and any adults who would also like to. And that is a theme that we are going to think about today. But um, to start us off, we're going to think about the fact that God made a promise to Noah on that mountain. He made a covenant with him. And we've got a very short video which we're going to play, which is um, to help you think about what is the most important promise that you have ever made. The most important promise I ever made was to love, honour and obey. The greatest promise I made was I'll never stop hugging you. The most important promises that I ever made were on the 30th of May 1987 when I married my wonderful husband Paul. The most important promise I ever make is to pray when asked for friends in need. One. So the most important promises I ever made were my wedding vows, but I have to say that the bit where it said I promised to obey, I did have my fingers crossed at that point because I had no intention of keeping that bit, as Paul will attest. <laughs> so we all make promises, we all make promises, and I think that that last comment is actually really important to remember, that when we, my, my granddad taught me about promises and he told me, don't ever make a promise. Don't ever promise to do something unless you are sure that you are going to do it. So don't make promises that you know you can't keep. Well, that's what I was taught, and that's, that kind of has always stuck with me. And so as we go through our mountains and valleys over the next few weeks, that um, theme of covenant and promise will keep coming back. So I know that it comes back next week in the, in the mountain that we're thinking about next week. So I know that James will speak a bit more about that later, so I'm not going to carry on with that. But let's open in prayer. God of love, passionate and strong, tender and careful, watch over us and hold us all the days of our life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we are going to begin now with some worship. So if you're able, please stand.
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home for joy shall fill my heart then I shall Search the world, but it couldn't find me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never real. You 
So please sit down, and Gaina is going to come and bring us our reading this morning, which is from partly from Genesis chapter 8 and partly from Genesis chapter 9. So I've given Gaina the intricate job of navigating between the two. <laughs> But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent the wind over the earth and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month of the ark came to rest on the mountain of Ararat. The water had continued to recede until the tenth month, and on the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains became visible. The second part of the reading is from Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock and all the wild animals, all those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and all the living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all the living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. Thank you, Gaynor. And now James is going to come and speak to us about that reading. And is, I never realised until it was read out loud how many times the word covenant was actually said. So I hope you're going to say something about covenant. Are we not? Okay, that's good. 
I don't think the word covenant turns up once. I'm just going to pray for you, all right? Thank you. Okay. God, thank you that over the course of the last week, you have been speaking to James about what to say to us today. I pray that you will bless his words and that as he speaks to us, we will hear your voice. Amen. Amen. So what is the greatest promise you have ever received? We saw in the video at the start um, about some of the most important promises people have made. Um, I love the one about never stop hugging some, uh, somebody else. That's a great promise, Leah, well done. But the most important promise I have ever received from another person is very easy to remember. It was a sunny July day, six and a half years ago now, and Chloe stood with me on our wedding day, and we made promises to each other. Chloe promised to take me as her husband, to have and to hold, from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death as do part. That is an incredibly powerful promise, to vow to stay with me through thick and thin, good and bad, through all my flaws, from leaving the kitchen cupboard doors open whenever I get anything out of them, to an annoying love of Lord of the Rings and board games, through things we might know are down the line, to things we might never see coming, to take all of this into account, and to say that through all of that, she will stand by me and support me and love me. That is an incredible promise to make to someone. I made the same one, just to be clear. But what do I have as a sign of this promise? It's just a small band of metal. It's not flashy. It's not worth much compared to some of the other things I own. But this thin ring of metal is a daily reminder of everything that Chloe promised to me on our wedding day. This little band of metal has a whole lot of hope, love, and trust wrapped up in it as well. So let's move on to another sign of hope, love, and trust. The rainbow. Here we have God's promise to Noah and all creation for the rest of time that never again will creation be wiped out like this by a flood. Imagine what this moment must have been like for Noah and his family. First, God warns you that a flood is coming, that sin has spread too far and too deep, and the only way to rescue creation is to almost wipe it out and start again. He commands you to build an ark, to take all that are to be saved and to keep them safe and alive until the earth is safe to walk on once more. You and your family work hard and fast to build the ark in the way God has told you to. You finish and gather all the animals God has asked for, and presumably all the supplies you will need for your voyage, and then the rains come. Forty days and nights of rain. Rain literally of biblical proportions. Rain that soaks and then covers the earth. The grass is gone. Then the trees. Then the hills. And even the mountains disappear. Days must have blended into night at times as the clouds covered the earth, unleashing water upon it. Everything you would have known, all the people, your home, the landmarks you knew so well, gone forever. Huddled together on your boat, you must have wondered if this would ever end. But you must have clung on to the faith that God must have got you to build the boat for a reason. That after all this, God wouldn't abandon you now. Eventually, the rain stops. The clouds break. The sun shines down once more upon the earth. The waters slowly recede, and your boat suddenly comes to a halt on top of a mountain, slowly emerging from the floodwaters. You wait 
and gradually see more of the land appearing as the water levels drop. Finally, the birds you send out return with proof that the waters have receded enough that it is safe to come out from the boat and reclaim the land. But what if sin starts to spread again? Noah was a good man, but he wasn't perfect, and neither was his family. What if they messed up? What if they allowed sin to become the overwhelming problem that it had been before? Would God send another flood? Would God save them a second time? But God makes this promise to them. I do use the word covenant. I'm quoting. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you. A covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. When the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on the earth. What relief, what joy this promise must have been to Noah and his family. To know that whenever they were even slightly worried that God might send another flood, they could look to the sky, see the rainbow, and remember it is the sign of God's promise to them. A sign of hope, love, and trust, not just for their future, but for the future of all generations to come. It's a promise God made to Noah, a promise God makes to humanity from that point onwards. But despite the power of this promise, Ararat is not the only mountain of promise in the Bible, and the rainbow is not the only sign of a promise from God in the Bible either. The most powerful promise to each and every one of us in the Bible is that of all those who place their trust in Jesus will receive the gift of eternal life. It is the promise that not only will God not send a flood to wipe out the earth to solve the problem of sin, but instead what God has done is come down to us, to live among us, to take the punishment of sin in our place and to die upon a cross to take the power of sin and death and break it forever so that we might be restored to full and perfect relationship with God. What a promise. What an amazing act of love from God. And the symbol of that awesome promise? Two pieces of wood nailed together. The cross on which Jesus died is the symbol we use to remember this most important of promises. The greatest sign of hope, love, and trust the world has ever seen. But what do all these signs have in common? The ring, the rainbow, the cross. Each of them loses meaning to those not involved in the promise. My wedding ring does not hold the same meaning for anyone else. If I died or if I lost it somehow, then whoever came into possession of it afterwards would not attach the same, piece of the same meaning to this piece of metal as I do. They might sell it, melt it down, throw it away. To them, it is just an object. Whereas to me, it is the symbol of that huge promise Chloe made to me. The rainbow can be seen as nothing more than a refraction of light. 
sunlight encountering more water molecules in the air and splitting into its different frequencies to create the effect of arches of color in the sky. As a sign, it loses its meaning outside of the story of Noah and God's promise. The cross is just two pieces of wood nailed together, a common form of execution at the time. It is nothing special until we accept the promise that it holds of a God who loves us, who died for us, who wants to live in relationship with us. St. Paul said that the good news of the gospel is foolishness to those who have not accepted it. But to those who have it, it is the power of God. The signs we have of promises we make to one another and of the promises God has made to us are nonsense to those who are not part of the promise themselves. But each of these signs are to me symbols of hope, love, and trust. Hope for my future, my marriage, my place in God's family. Knowledge of the love that is shared in my marriage, given by God to me and all creation. Trust that those who have made the promises to me will keep them and hold me safe in those promises. And so I just want to leave you with a few questions today. What signs do you place your trust in? What promises do you rely on in your life? What does the rainbow mean to you? A sign of promise or just a pretty accident of physics? Is the cross just two pieces of wood nailed together? Or is it something infinitely more? So as the worship band comes back, let's take a moment of silence just to think of those questions and what our response to them is. Please stand if you're able and we will continue in worship. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty Tower of refuge and strength. 
Please sit down. And we come now to communion. And there is a point in the communion liturgy where Jesus says that this is the blood of the new covenant, the new promise that is happening between us and God for the forgiveness of sins. And it's amazing once you hear the word covenant once, how often you then hear it. <laughs> so let's take a moment as we come to communion. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Our Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. In this place and in yours, let us pray together with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, one body, because we all share in one bread. God's holy gifts for God's holy people. Jesus Christ is holy. Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The love of the Lord Jesus draw you to himself. The power of the Lord Jesus strengthen you in his service. The joy of the Lord Jesus fill your hearts. So please do come forward for communion. And if you would prefer to have a blessing, just come forward and um, keep your hands by your side so I know that that's what you would prefer. So everybody is welcome to communion. And a wait for um, a verger or a steward will let you know when to come forward.
end our post-communion prayer. Lord, we have broken your bread and received your life. By the power of your spirit, keep us always in your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So please sit down and we come now to our intercessions. And this is something that it's very easy to do at home. Um, if you have some skittles, and we do have some skittles at the back. Um, so the response to each prayer is going to be, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. But you probably don't need that on the screen if it's, if it's okay. Adam, is it possible to see the... Yeah, brilliant. So what we're going to do is use the... Um, oh, if I can get into the Skittles. We're going to use the Skittles to pray with and we're going to use the different colours of the Skittles to represent... Now, there's a flaw in that, isn't there? Because we're missing a colour. <laughs> Might have to run to the back if there's no more in this one. Let's see. Have we got any green? Oh, we have got some greens. Excellent. So, the idea is that um, each colour represents a different type of prayer. So, we're going to start with red. You can, you can use whichever colour you want, but we're going to start with red. And we will pray for our family. So as we pray for our family, let's remember those who live with us and those people who are in our family and live far away. And we bring to God all of those things that we know they need. And we pray for relationships in our families that are difficult. And we ask God to bring reconciliation. So the next colour that I'm going to use is orange. And this is going to be to pray for our friends. And as I lay these skittles out, I'm just going to pour some warmish water onto the plate. And hopefully what we will do as we pray is create a rainbow of colours. So let's pray for our friends, all of those we know who are in need. And at this time, we bring to God the Heard family. And we pray for Tim, who has lost his brother. We pray for peace and comfort for them. We pray that they will know God's strength. So the next thing that we're going to pray for is our work or our school and the relationships that we have there. God, we pray that you will bless us in our work and our school's life, and that you will help us to be beacons of shining light, sharing your love in the places where we spend most of our days. Pour out your blessing upon the people we work with and go to school with. And the next colour we're going to use is green. And that is going to be praying for the environment. So we pray for all of those who are working to make our world a better, safer place. We pray for all of those who are working for the future of our world. We pray for those who have a heart for your creation and we pray blessing on their work. And we pray that you will help us to be more aware of how we can help environmental matters, how we can fight for the future of our world, the world that you have given us, Lord. And now we are going to use the yellow. And we're going to bring to God 
all of those people we know who are suffering in body, mind or spirit, those who are ill, those who are grieving. And we bring ourselves to God, all of those things that we need him to help us with because we know we can't do it by ourselves. And we pray that we will know his strength, his love and his power in our lives. So God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So hopefully that rainbow is going to develop further and that's something that um, is really easy to do at home, especially with your children. There are some skittles at the back as you go out in little packets if you'd like to go home and do that yourself. So we come now to our um, church family news and um, the... Yeah, very exciting. Now, I think that some of you missed the notice last week that we are going to be getting a curate in July. And her name is Faye. And she is currently at Trinity College in Bristol. And she will be, um, hopefully, in the next few weeks, in the next month, hopefully, she is going to visit. So we're going to be able to um, bring her up and she can tell us a few things about herself. She has got a cat, if you are interested. Um, so, so, yeah, so hopefully we're going to get to know her a little bit more. Um, uh, I forgot to put on the Church Family News email that there will be a quiz this week. I will send out the details for that on Zoom, and it will be me in charge. So um, James, James, I think, is on holiday or going off somewhere nice. So I'm going to be in charge of the Zoom quiz. So please join me so I don't feel lonely on that. <laughs> um, I think that that is all we need to tell you about just now. So please stand and we will have our final worship song.
you sit down because there is something that I remember I needed to tell you. Uh, so yesterday, the PCC had an away day where we um, discussed and kind of responded to all of the feedback that we've been given um, about the vision for the church. And so what we're going to do on Sunday the 20th of February, so in about two weeks' time, is um, in the evening, we're going to invite anybody in the congregation who would like to come along, um, just to come along to church, and we're going to present to you where we're up to and give a chance for you to respond to that and pray about that, um, add into that, and that process will continue throughout Lent. We're going to have a focus on praying for the vision through Lent, and we'll have two prayer evenings during Lent on a Sunday evening to carry that on. But on the 20th of February, we want to feed back to you where we are now, um, and then we can use that as a springboard to pray further. We want to make sure that everybody feels that they have had the chance to contribute at every stage to where, where we go in the future, where we're headed. So please, you are welcome to come in two weeks' time, and we'll advertise that further. So, a blessing for you all. God, the Holy Trinity, make you strong in faith and love, defend you on every side, and guide you in truth and peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen.